you, everyone. Don't worry, I'll let you talk in the middle of my uh, presentation. In just a few minutes, there will be some audience participation. I'm here to talk about the impending complexity apocalypse. I love predicting apocalypses because it's win-win. Either I'm the last person standing who got it right, or there's no apocalypse. <laughs> Either way, good, good outcome for us. So let's think about how humans make decisions and how they're going to make decisions in the new world. We'll borrow from Colonel John Boyd the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. It's a simple behavioral economics model for how the human brain processes you know, new information and what cycles we will go through. Um, now, it's important to understand that we have to frame each piece of this. When we talk about observation, it's about the attention and our attention spotlight. It's our proximity, novelty, and urgency, the things that are new and relevant. We ignore most of the world that goes on around us. You drive home, and you don't know how you got there. You saw a lot of cars, but your brain didn't. You know, it's how we orient ourselves. It's what context and what framing do we have? What expectations do we have for the world? When you hear the news story about dog bites man, not very interesting. Man bites dog, very novel. Like, that's an exciting one, right? Your frame is set, sets you up to see certain entities as being new and novel. The decision making is about the risks that we're comfortable with taking. It's about our costs that we predict the fears we have for the world, and the outcomes that we see. And of course, our action is about the things that we know how to do. Right? What are we practiced and trained at doing? And so this is a great model. Um, he designed it for flying fighter, fi fighter jets. Uh, but we apply this in the business world as sort of a simple shorthand. Now, when we think about observation, let's talk a little bit about a hydra for a moment. So about uh, 700 million years ago, humans diverge evolutionarily from the common hydra. Um, and the Hydra has a really interesting attention schema. The, the way that it observes the world is it has neurons all over its body, sensors, to tell when it has been touched. If you touch a Hydra, some set of sensors say, I've been touched. The Hydra has no way to distinguish between sensors. It doesn't know if it was touched on the left side or the right side. All it knows is, I was touched. Now, that's really important for the Hydra to only get that much information, because all that it can do is blurp. Right? and hope that that moves it away from the predator. If not, no more hydra. Uh, but thinking about left or right doesn't help because it can't control left versus right. Uh, so this happens to us as well. You know, we've evolved this very complex model of the world that filters out our attention in so many ways. You know, all of this information that's coming in, you know, millions and millions of bits of information per second, you can process 40 bits of information. That's all your brain can handle. So we filter things out. We can look at how predators filter them out. And predators build a model of the world that they expect their eye to see, and they only notice deviations from it. It's why often we're told, don't move when a predator is around, because they're looking, looking, looking. Oh, wait, some pixels changed from what I expected them to be. Let's pay attention to that. Uh, humans are a little more aggressive. We model the world as it ought to be, or as we think it ought to be. And we look for deviations from that. This runs into places where you have cognitive blindness. If anybody's seen you know, the invisible gorilla, the, you know, the act of the gorilla walking through people passing a basketball, you're fixated on one thing, so your brain filters it out. When you're driving, you don't count pedestrians unless they're running in front of you, at which point you might want to pay some attention to them. For orientation, you know, our models of the world are very dangerously wrong. Um, you know, hazards were very simple. Everybody familiar with the Ford Pinto? Right? Everybody knows, like, if you're not an automotive engineer, you still know what the automotive engineers did wrong, right? They put a gas tank at the back of a car, where if you ran into it, you cracked the gas tank. It didn't explode. That would be a much cooler story, much sadder for the people involved. Uh, instead, it cracks, it leaks, and accidents become fires over time. Um, however, so we can talk about that, and we say, look, no engineer should ever do that again. But now let's take the Jeep Cherokee can be taken over at 70 miles an hour while driving down a highway by a hacker with a laptop somewhere and anywhere in the world. What did Jeep do wrong? People still struggle answering this question. Every system in the Jeep did exactly what it was designed to do. The, the emergent properties of that system are so complicated that this vulnerability that exists is not obvious on simple inspection. And we run into that when we orient ourselves to complex models of the world. We just talked about this with Nokia. We're sitting here with the benefit of a decade of hindsight, and we still don't know what Nokia did wrong. 
we feel like we should, but it's a complex world. We try to navigate it down to a simple model about disruption. Um, no offense to the case study, but the first cell phone was not disruptive technology, right? It was this big brick that had that phone attached to it, right? But the people who, who built it, it was just taking existing technology, the smallest portable phone system that you could deploy, and gave it to individuals. They couldn't have foreseen where Apple took it. And so when we're making choices about risks, these orientations become really hard for us to understand because the world, we think it's simple. We need it to be simple. Um, and then how do we decide? And what is risk? Um, Sam Peltzman, economist at the University of Chicago, uh, a number of years ago was uh, talking about the effects of automobile safety regulation. For many people, you think wearing seatbelts is just mandatory. It's what you always do. At the time, there were no laws about wearing seatbelts. There was a debate as to whether we should have a national seatbelt law. Sam Peltzman said, look, humans are wired to accept a certain amount of risk. And this is a great thing. If we accepted no risk, we would never do anything. You'd stay locked in your house until you died because you didn't take the risk of going to the market to buy food or going hunting to get food as a hunter-gatherer. Um, so we take risk. We like to take risk. And we like to take the same amount of risk. And if what will happen, you know, you're going along, and this is your perceived risk. We're not good at understanding actual risk. That's OK. Our perceptions are normally good. Um, and when something comes along that increases your risk, what do we do? We go, oh my goodness, I have to do something different. I'll act to drive down my risk. And this is how humans behave. And you know, it works in the opposite direction as well. If we take away risk from them, they will act more dangerously. Sam Peltzman argued that putting seatbelts in cars was tantamount to killing pedestrians, it would cause drivers to drive more recklessly. And everybody chuckles. It's such an outlandish, crazy argument. Go look at the NHTSA data about deaths per million miles driven, and what you will discover is that the rate of drop for drivers has gone down significantly. The rate for, for passengers has gone down less significantly. The rate for pedestrians has held almost constant and the rate for motorcyclists has gone up. The only thing Sam Peltzman got wrong was who we were going to kill. He didn't think about the motorcyclists that are driving more rapidly was likely to kill. Now, Sam Peltzman did get one thing right, as humorous as it is. The only safety thing you need if you want to save pedestrians is a spike on the steering wheel. So it would cause us all to drive very safely, um, but probably not very effectively. <laughs> So I'm glad we didn't listen to him. I personally really do enjoy driving my car. Um, so it's all about how we change our risk awareness when we make these decisions that is going to adjust our future behaviors. So we can think about the, dis the difference between our perceived risk and our actual risk as being an important place for us to understand discrepancies. You know, when we increase our actual risk, but we don't understand it, we're ignorant of threats. We can know about a vulnerability or risk. We can suffer from FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If you've ever had a security vendor try to sell you anything, this is slide three on their PowerPoint deck. Um, we can reduce risk. The world doesn't always just get worse. Sometimes we don't even understand the way that it got better. Somebody improved the world for us, and they didn't bother to tell us. Uh, sometimes we do understand normal risk reduction. Uh, and other times we engage in security theater. Now, what's fascinating is what one person calls security theater might be stealth improvements in another fashion. We all make fun of the TSA. Uh, you know, Bruce Schneier loves to do it. It's sort of his favorite pet target. But think about what the TSA actually does for us. The stealth improvement that they have given us is they have caused terrorists to have to try new things. They might not actually be good at detecting the old things, but the terrorists don't know that. They don't know that they will be successful, and so they try new things. So they try a shoe bomber, a bomb that's never been tried before, and the first time, it doesn't work. Right? So some stealth improvements that we should give them credit for. Now there's an axis on here that I've left blank. It seems weird. How can you get safer but not realize it, or vice versa? So let's think about blind compliance, blindly adhering to something you're told will make you safer. And in fact, I have the great seat over here that's sitting next to a drop, and it has this little sign next to it that says, don't roll off the drop, uh, and a little barrier there. And it reminded me of uh, when I was in England many years ago, there was a sign in the bathroom that said, for your comfort and safety before showering, please ensure the bath mat is securely in place and the shower curtain is inside the bath. 
You can tell yourself the story of how this sign got here. Somebody sued the hotel chain because they slipped and fell. And after whatever happened in that lawsuit, the general counsel got together with outside counsel and they said, look, we can reduce our liability if we just put a caution warning here. Right? You know, maybe we were negligent, but now we won't be negligent because we told you not to do this. Do you know what wasn't in that bathroom when I went to take a shower? A bath mat or a shower curtain. <laughs> So they were blindly complying in a way that they thought reduced their risk, and now they have increased their risk, right? If I sue them, they're reckless. They knew better, and they didn't give me the safety tools. I told this story for a couple of years before somebody who worked for me said, yeah, but I bet that was the safest shower you had ever taken. <laughs> he was right. I was terrified in that shower. I'm like pinned up against one wall. You ever tried to bathe while holding onto a wall? I have a lot of sympathy for people with one arm, because for a little while, that was me. Um, and so if we can make ourselves aware and believe in that awareness, oftentimes what happens is we adjust to make ourselves safer without believing it. And that can be a really powerful change agent. It can also be a really dangerous change agent. So then there's how we act. System one versus system two, quick audience participation. Words will appear either on the left or right of this line. Say either the word left or right, depending on which side of the line the word appears on. No, you're not in the army yet. We're going to do this one more time. Isn't that fascinating? How expensive that got. System one is the lizard brain, the fast responding part of your system that does not involve conscious cognition. It can drive you home. It's terrifying. It can read words, but left-right is a really hard thing for it to grasp. That requires system two, conscious cognition, something that is very expensive. We have evolved to not do conscious cognition. Our evolutionary advantage is the thing we want to do least because it burns a lot of calories. So when we're acting, we use trained responses, and you can train responses quickly. You just saw it happen. Eight words, and I taught you not to pay attention to the instruction of left-right, but just to read the words except you all corrected, it was great, it was humorous. So we're in a place where we're at the end of the right situation. Like our attention model doesn't work anymore because we can't filter by the 150 people around us that are part of our tribe living in the middle of the desert. Our Facebook tells us that our tribe is thousands of people. We find about, out about things that are happening in real time with visual proximity so we know it's real to us. You know, our models are completely wrong we see the evidence that confirms our beliefs about the world, even though they're not right. You know, we tell ourselves about hindsight expectations. Oh, I ex totally expected this to happen. Anybody could see that Nokia was doomed. No, at the time, everybody thought Apple was doomed. Uh, you know, the, the risks, we don't understand costs and returns on the choices that we make. And for our responses, as you just saw, we repurpose the responses even when they're not appropriate to the situation. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you.